Welcome to this month's edition of Missouri Legislative Update. We're reporting to you from the upper gallery of the Missouri Senate, where citizens across the state sit and observe important debate in the upper chamber. Reporting for the Missouri Senate, I'm Jennifer Yapel. And I'm Jonathan Lorenz reporting for the Missouri House of Representatives. The Missouri House put its stamp of approval on its version of the state's 2014 operating budget. In this month's lead story, we take a look at how the $25 billion budget invoked strong emotions from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. Of our increases. The Missouri House approved all 13 of the appropriation bills that make up its version of the state's 2014 operating budget. The $24.8 billion budget includes a $150 million increase in total funding to the state's elementary and secondary education budget. It also includes more than $200 million in new funding for mental health programs. The speaker believes the House did a responsible job spending the taxpayers' hard-earned dollars. Taxes do not grow on trees and some in summon substance. These are, these are taxes. Uh, taxes come from, from businesses and, and job creators. Uh, they do not come from government. Uh, so it's us to us, up, up to us to be proper stewards of, of the taxpayer money of the state. And I think in this nearly $25 billion budget, we have effectively done that. The House's proposed budget also includes a flat $500 raise for every state employee. One item the House's budget does not include is money for Medicaid expansion. Democrats tried several times to include funding to add more than 300,000 people to the state's Medicaid rolls, but failed each time. Quite frankly, I think Medicaid was a sing obviously the singular issue. Um, we, we passed a budget where we left 900 something million dollars of taxpayer money on the table. I don't think it's anything to hang our hat on. Democrats claimed the Medicaid expansion would be a game changer for the state's dragging economy. Despite their efforts, the majority continued to oppose Medicaid expansion without changing the way the system operates first. This side cares about people. We want to have health care. We want to deliver it. But a program that is admittedly by their proponents 25 to 30 percent waste, fraud, and abuse, and we're supposed to just expand it because it's free money. At the end of the day, the House approved each of the budget bills and sent all 13 of them to the Senate for consideration. Just after the Missouri Senate received the House's fiscal year 2014 budget plan, senators approved a measure designed to help areas damaged by natural disasters rebuild. Senate Communications correspondent Brad Bashore has more on Senate Bill 366. Known as the Rebuild Damaged Infrastructure Program, Senate Bill 366 would appropriate state funds to help repair and rebuild areas declared as natural disasters by the President. The new program is designed to be a mechanism to help cities like Joplin, Missouri, rebuild after a massive tornado struck the city in 2011. The bill is sponsored by Senator John Lamping of Ledoux. He says a bulk of the aid delivered to Joplin during the aftermath was spent on immediate necessities like food, water, temporary shelter, and cleanup, and that very little money was left over for the reconstruction and repair of the city. The projects that will be eligible include transportation, communication, sewage, water, electric systems, public elementary and secondary school buildings. The program would transfer money from other designated state funds to help create about $15 million for the new program. During debate, Senator Brad Logger of Savannah wanted to make sure the new fund could be used on a statewide basis for areas in need in the future. I would prefer we not limit it geographically because that way this thing can be used as a tool even beyond Joplin. The bill received support from both sides of the aisle. Senator Ryan McKenna of Crystal City says the program could be a blueprint for future disaster recovery. I think what you've done here is good. It's a good uh, benchmark for what, how we ought to do this in the future. Senator Jason Holzman of Kansas City offered an amendment during debate that would have created a one-tenth of a cent statewide sales tax to help fund disaster recovery efforts in the future. He says his proposed sales tax increase could create an estimated 60 to 80 million dollars. All people in the state of Missouri will pay the sales tax and all people in the state of Missouri are vulnerable to a natural disaster. This is truly a communal need that government serves. This is our 
ability to show the wherewithal and the political will to say that we want everybody to share in this cost. Senator Holzman's amendment was later defeated. Senate Bill 366 now moves to the House for similar consideration. If approved and signed into law, the new program would start July 1st of this year and expire in June 2014. Reporting for the Missouri Senate, I'm Brad Bayshore. The Missouri House passed a proposal aiming to protect Missouri's Second Amendment rights. Supporters claim the Second Amendment Preservation Act is all about standing up to the federal government. And it was even agreed upon. The Missouri House put its stamp of approval on a proposal aiming to protect the Second Amendment rights of Missouri citizens. The Second Amendment Preservation Act makes all federal acts and laws intended to infringe upon the Second Amendment null and void. The sponsor of the Second Amendment legislation claims his intention is to protect the constitutional rights of all Missourians. Our constitutions are the supreme laws of this land that cannot be usurped by legislative fiat at any level. In addition, the proposal also includes language allowing school districts to arm teachers. It also makes it illegal for any law enforcement officer or federal agent to enforce any federal law or regulation intended to restrict one's Second Amendment rights. Opponents to the bill claim the radical proposal goes too far and is about more than gun rights. This is not guns. This is about nullification. This has nothing to do with guns whatsoever. It is about Missouri saying that we will not follow the United States Constitution. It is about secession, and only about secession. This bill has nothing to do with secession and everything about recapturing and, or and reorganizing what really is the proper role and authority of the state government. So that's not secession. That is actually shoring up what our founding fathers intended. That makes this state stronger, and that makes this nation stronger. Lawmakers passed the Second Amendment Preservation Act by a 115 to 41 vote and sent it to the Senate for consideration. Senators approved a measure that would update laws and guidelines relating to welfare fraud in Missouri. Senate Communications correspondent Brad Bayshore has more on this legislation. The upper chamber recently approved a measure that would strictly limit where and how electronic benefit transfer or EBT cards can be used in the state. The cards are issued to Missourians who receive temporary assistance for needy families or TANF benefits. The bill, sponsored by Senator Will Krause of Lee Summit, would ban the use of EBT cards in casinos, liquor stores, and adult entertainment venues. Senator Krause says the bill would bring the state's food stamp program in line with new federal restrictions and add language to existing Missouri law. So we added a phrase in the, in the Senate sub that basically alludes to adult uh, establishments or in not, not in the best interest of the child. Those who violate provisions of this act would be required to reimburse the Missouri Department of Social Services. In addition, a person who knowingly accepts EBT cards in violation of this act would be fined by the state. Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal of University City co-sponsored the measure and helped guide the bill through the Senate. And so I wanted to make sure that the dollars that we have go to the people and especially the children that need uh, those resources. Senate Bill 251 would also require the Department of Social Services to establish and maintain a statewide toll-free phone number to receive complaints of suspected fraud abuse. Reporting for the Missouri Senate, I'm Brad Bayshore. Lawmakers approved a proposal dealing with the backlash from the Department of Revenue scandal. In this next story, we take a look at how the Missouri House responded to the news of a state agency sending Missourians private information to the federal government. Your privacy rights. The Missouri House approved legislation regarding the Department of Revenue and its gathering of information related to licenses. The Department of Revenue recently made its way onto headlines because of reports claiming the department was sharing the private information of concealed gun permit holders with the federal government. House Bill 787 makes it illegal for the Department of Revenue to retain copies of any personal documents used to acquire driver's or non-driver's licenses. The sponsor of the proposal claims his legislation stops the state from collecting information it doesn't need. It stops the state from needlessly collecting a massive database of source documents that the state doesn't need 
and by their own admission, they don't even check. The proposal also states the Department of Revenue must destroy any source documents obtained by the Department for Drivers or Non-Drivers applicants by September 11th of this year. However, opponents believe the legislation is simply grandstanding and not dealing with the bigger issue. We obviously don't seem to have a problem selling to 4,700 other individuals, as Representative Kelly had said. Um, why was it not a problem then? Why is it only on this one issue? Lawmakers approved the privacy proposal with more than 135 supporting votes and sent it to the Senate for consideration. With a near party line vote, lawmakers in the Missouri Senate gave their final approval to Senate Bill 112 that would authorize the New Markets Tax Credit, a program so popular it's been dubbed the Missouri Model because other states have examined and tried to replicate this Missouri program designed to help get small businesses off the ground and spur economic development. The New Markets Tax Credit Program provides supplemental funding for investment entities that have been approved for this tax credit in order to direct more funding to Missouri projects. This program provides state and federal tax credits to those who make investments into approved funds, which would then be invested in eligible projects located in low-income census tracts in Missouri. This is a very long-term investment for small businesses in the state of Missouri. It's a, it's a program that has worked extremely well, and I think that we should renew it uh, for another six years uh, and allow, uh, especially with the reforms that we're adding, and allow more small businesses in the state of Missouri uh, to, to get this investment capital. Senator Jason Holzman of Kansas City supports the measure and says Missouri should be more aggressive with economic incentives like the New Markets Tax Credit. In front of us today, the extension that we're debating is arguably the uh, highest performing tax credit that we have in the state of Missouri. However, not all senators share their praise of this tax incentive program. Some express their concern over the state and federal government subsidizing private investors and taking away subsidies from citizens on the lower end of the economic spectrum. I would suggest that he has now become, his willingness to invest has now become dependent upon the federal and state government. So these programs create a culture of dependency, but it's dependency on the extreme opposite end of the income spectrum. Senate Minority Floor Leader Jolie Justice of Kansas City offers an amendment, which was later defeated, that would have created the Missouri Angel Investment Incentive Act in Senate Bill 112. The amendment would have provided tax credits to investors who provide monetary support to new businesses. I know there is a debate right now on whether or not government should be involved in, in job creation. Um, I would like to say that we are already involved in job creation, and if we're going to go down that road, I think one of the pieces that we need to fit together into a total picture is a tool for those folks who are in the startup phase. Senate Bill 112 was voted out of the Senate in mid-April and is now in the House for similar consideration. Up next on Missouri Legislative Update, veteran Capitol reporter Bob Pretty of the Missouri Net sits down with Senate Education Committee Chairman David Pierce for a Capitol Dialogue over the state of education. Stay tuned. Seven thousand high school students drop out every school day. That's a line of desks more than four miles long. We can keep students in school. Visit boostup.org and take the first step. Welcome to the Capital Dialogue segment of our program. Our topic today is education, and we're going to start by talking to Senator David Pierce, who is the head of the Senate Education Committee. You also keep an eye on education issues on the Senate Appropriations Committee, as I recall, too. So you, you have a couple of very influential positions in the State Senate when it comes to this whole issue of education. Where are we with funding for, first of all, we'll talk about elementary and secondary, and then for higher education, too, because that kind of comes under some of your bailiwick. So where are we with funding for our elementary and secondary education schools now? Well, as far as the process we're in right now, we finished the, uh, the budget on the Senate side, and now we'll go to a, a conference kind of position to, to work out a compromise with the House. But so far, there's an increase of about $67 million 
for K through 12. Um, obviously, it's good to have an increase. I would like to see it be more. And we're, we're not fully funded with the foundation formula for our schools, but it's a step in the right direction. You're not fully funded by a big margin. Right. Uh, estimates are that, that to fully fund the foundation formula would be another $600 million, and that would be every year. And so it'd be $600 million, and the next year it'd be an increase of that as well. So, so $67 million is better than nothing, but still not, not near far the, uh, as far as we need to be. You have been here while we have fallen behind mm -hmm. on that promise that was made when the last foundation formula was written. Why hasn't the Missouri legislature kept its promise? Well, I think it, it was when the new foundation formula was established in 2005, the intent was that it would be fully funded and it would be phased in over a seven year period. Uh, at the time that it was done in 2005, which, which I voted for, is we were always expecting the economy would expand. We were always hoping that, that we'd always have growth to our revenue. And uh, three or four years ago, that just did not materialize. And so that's when we actually fell short of, of fully funding the foundation formula. Um, you know, the role we have in government is how much that we tax or how much that we have a tax policy to bring in new revenue is a tough one. And so we need to make sure that if and when we increase taxes, that it's not a disincentive of the economy. And so the legislature has felt to, to not increase revenue that way and hopefully grow the economy to then bring in revenue. Is that realistic? I mean, can you, can you hit that $620 million hole by waiting for the economy to profit from the tax cuts that are made that reduce the amount of income that's available for schools and other programs? Well, I, I do think that, that you can reach a point of saturation where you're taxing the state too much. Um, that it's a disincentive of the economy and quite honestly people don't have to live in Missouri and we have seen cases with uh, Illinois where uh, their taxes have increased so much that a lot of businesses are looking to go somewhere else and so you need to be very careful when you're when you're establishing something like that and yet at the same time uh, you get what you pay for and you have to raise enough revenue to pay for basic needs and services and of course education is number one there. Have we met our responsibilities? Because well, every time I turn around, you guys are cutting taxes again. Well, um, uh, now we, we could spend a whole <laughs> yeah, we could, <laughs> show on that. Uh, Senate Bill 26 was a bill that I voted against, and that was one to, to, to cut taxes, to cut revenues some $700 million to the state. Uh, I didn't feel that that was uh, good in the long-term answers of the state, uh, and, and basically because of my role in the Education Committee, that we're underfunded, and yet then we're cutting another $700 million. I just didn't think that was a step in the right direction. How about higher education? There are some changes coming in higher education. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a formula now. We're looking at some performance standards for higher education. How difficult is it for, to, set higher, to set performance standards for higher ed? It's tough because we have 13 public four-year uh, institutions in the state. And they're all different. They're different parts of the state. They have different missions. And uh, to come up with one standard to fit all is very, very difficult. In fact, that's what we're right in the middle of in, in the Senate right now, coming up with performance funding. But I think it's a step in the right direction, that uh, if you're doing well, if you're meeting the standards which you've established for your yourself, then you get rewarded. And if not, then you're going to get less funding from the state. Now, that's an important point you just made. Who sets these standards? It was the schools that set the standards for themselves, wasn't it? Exactly. It's not just, you didn't do that. Right. I didn't. Uh, the commissioner of higher education didn't. It's the schools themselves came up with five standards. And quite honestly, we, we think that those standards should be fairly tough. They should be rigorous. Uh, they should be challenging so our universities are aspiring to something better. And so uh, that is, that's uh, one thing that we're looking at. In fact, the governor and his budget and the Senate agreed with that all new funding would be based on performance standards. And so as universities excel, then they're going to get more funding. The formula. Mm -hmm. As I recall, didn't the formula work out to where you're already underfunded with higher education? What we did is we took a look at 10 states. Those five states right above us and those five states right below us for per capita income. And so we looked at their higher institutions of, of higher learning to see how much they funded. Yes, we were below. Uh, we're at about $850 million for those 13 institutions, whereas our surrounding states in those uh, peer states, they're at about $1.2 billion. So we're some $400 million below what peer states, what similar states to Missouri are. What are your greatest fears? about underfunding elementary and secondary and higher ed at this point? Well, we are meeting at the bare minimum our constitutional obligation of having at least 25 percent that goes to education. That's both K through 12 as well as higher education, but, but we can do better. And I do think for higher education, especially for performance funding, I think that will be helpful. 
Uh, I think that will send a very positive message about funding for higher education and then also what we expect from our uh, institutions of higher learning. Last question for you. How long do you think it will be or do you ever think we'll be able to reach the levels that you think or that the numbers would indicate we need to be at? Uh, it will take several years. Uh, although I do think it's still important to look at those numbers and it's something to shoot for um, through the appropriations process and then still uh, have high standards, uh, expect a lot from our, from our colleges and from our schools. Up next, Bob Pretty gets the other side of the story when he sits down with one of the House's top Democrats. That's after the break on Missouri Legislative Update. It's not his new group of friends. It's not the video games. It's not the neighborhood. Mom, do I have to go to school today? The biggest threat to your child's future could be you. Every day they miss, even in middle school, puts their graduation at risk. Our next guest is Representative Janice Monticello. She is from St. Louis County and she's a former classroom teacher. That's good experience for her because in the legislature in the House of Representatives, she's a member of the Budget Committee that looks at education. She's also on the Elementary and Secondary Education Committee and the Joint Education Committee. When you were a classroom teacher in St. Louis County for 25 years, special ed, mm -hmm. uh, and, you, and you thought of the people up here who were passing the laws, providing the funding, making the policies for teachers like you. What did you think of them? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's why I'm here. It, it, it literally is the reason that I decided to come up here. Uh, I, the decisions they were making were having a direct impact in my classroom and my colleagues' classrooms. and. Um, so I was really concerned and more importantly I saw my students becoming less and less engaged in the process they didn't feel they were heard they didn't think feel that their voices were heard so I wanted them to know that government should and can be different than what it is so I had concerns with so you came up here with some pretty high ideals mm -hmm. and you've been here now four years uh, this, this is starting your, my third year your third year okay term. your second term mm -hmm. and how has reality hit you um, I don't give up. So, um, you know, there is the reality factor, but I'm still fighting for the same goals. And there are frustrating times. Last few weeks have been particularly frustrating with some of the education issues and, and talking with my son. He's like, Mom, that's why you're there. So if, if those things weren't going on, there'd be no need for you to be there. So um, you just have to do what you can do. And you have to make sure. I promised my students I would make sure their voices were heard. And that's what I, what I try to do every day when I come to work. So what, what do you tell the people here that your students would want to say to them? I do try to bring their voice. I try to bring my classroom experience. They, they want to be relevant. Um, they want the decisions that are being made about them to have a positive impact. My goal is to make sure that whatever we do um, has positive educational outcomes. So I always come back to that. How are, we, how are we going to get positive educational outcomes? And if you're going to introduce a bill to me, are we going to be able to get those positive educational outcomes? Um, the kids want, they want to learn. They want to be educated. They want highly effective teachers in their classroom. They, they, um, they want to know that their voice or they want to see government working so it's not only for me it's not just those educational issues and educational bills they need and want to see that government's working for them and their voices are heard it's, it's same as my other constituents it's not just my students but when I get constituent calls they want to know that I'm listening to them they want to know that government is listening listening to them and that's how it should work I taught special ed civics classes so the issue of special education not special education the issue of teacher accountability has been around long before you got here mm -hmm probably going to be around long after both of us are gone. But how does teacher accountability seem to you, not only as someone who comes out of the classroom as a teacher, but as someone who now is working in Jefferson City on this very issue? How do you think that should be shaped to be most effective to people like, like you were for 25 years? First of all, we have an accountability piece in place. DESE has just implemented a new evaluation piece as part, part of the waiver. Um, I think we need to let, get that up and get it running and make sure that it's, it's going to be effective. Um, I, again, when we talk about House Bill 631, that it directly went to assessment and tenure, when I look at that bill, I've asked, show me something in that bill that will lead to increased educational outcomes. There's nothing in there that talks about instructional strategies. There's nothing in there that helps teachers um, address some of the needs in terms of students um, in poverty, minority students. Um, all it addresses is evaluating teachers. So we don't know why teachers aren't 
perform if they're performing um, below expectations and there's nothing in that bill that examines that it could be curriculum it could be environment of the students it would be silly for me to say that highly effective teachers have no impact on education. No, there's no disagreement on that. But it's also just as silly to say that there aren't other factors that impact educational outcomes. So for me that you have that, a type of bill like that that is just so one-sided and single-issue um, is likely to do more harm. In fact, in other places around the country where it's been implemented, it, it's been dismal failure. When you look at New York City, when you look at um, Texas schools, Atlanta, um, other other districts, it hasn't been effective. In fact, scores have tended to drop. In many of those districts, there have been they've been called into question about cheating. Um, some have um, Atlanta and in Texas, they've admitted there's been cheating, and there's certainly the question up in D.C. under Michelle Ree, um, where we don't know because they won't allow a full um, review of the testing procedures there, and she denied that when she was there, and the district still refuses to look at that. So, we need good educational outcomes, and we need to know how we're going to do that. And I don't see this bill addressing those concerns. Do you, have you found in your experience here that ideology collides with practicality when it comes to teacher evaluations, funding, other aspects of education that you bring from your own experience? Absolutely. And I think that none of us would, would go into the me medical field. I, I mentioned this in committee one day. Um, me being interested in brain surgery or neurofit, it's not going to make me a brain surgeon. I can be interested, I could have a passion for it, but that doesn't mean that I'd be able to be a neurosurgeon. I trust you, nobody would want me operating on their brains. But I think a lot of folks, we've all been to school, we've all had experience with education and with teachers, so we all kind of feel like we know what's going on in the classroom when indeed most of us don't unless you have that experience. So I think there are a lot of my colleagues, their intent is very good. They want better outcomes for students. Um, and I think there are groups, issue groups here in the Capitol that are trying to influence them. And, and, and again, going back to this issue of just accountability and assessment and tenure, um, and I think people are so hungry for better outcomes to be able to go back to their districts and say that we're doing something to make it better that they kind of um, grasp onto this when, in my opinion, it's very short-sighted and I don't think it's going to lead to the outcomes that we want. Thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you. And that's our show for this month. If you have any questions regarding anything going on in the Missouri House, you can visit our website at www.house.mo.gov. I'm Jonathan Lorenz reporting for the Missouri House of Representatives. And if you have any questions about the legislation that appeared in this program, please visit the Missouri Senate website at www.senate.mo.gov. There you'll find the contact information for the 34 members of the Missouri Senate, as well as a link to the Senate's newsroom website. I'm Jennifer Gapel reporting for the Missouri Senate. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on Missouri Legislative Update.